Last week, Shelby County Commissioner Erica Sugarman told a Fox affiliate that the Republicans who run the state were looking to punish Memphis for reappointing Pearson. They are allegedly looking to withhold funding for schools and money that would help restore the basketball stadium in the city of Memphis. Earlier today, Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called on the Department of Justice to investigate the expulsions of Justin Jones and Justin J. Pearson. Specifically, the senators argue that their expulsions violated their First Amendment rights to free speech and assembly and violated the rights of the citizens of Memphis and Nashville. Joining me now is the newly reinstated State Representative Justin J. Pearson of Tennessee. And I misstated, I said, I meant Lorraine Motel. Y'all know what I meant. But I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Representative Pearson, it is good to call you representative again. And uh, I just want to first get to you the feeling. We could see what the feeling was when the three of you were together again and announcing your really victorious return. But tell me how you feel about what this process has done for you, it has made the Justins quite world famous, but also re-elevated the issue of multiracial democracy. Tell me how you're feeling. Well, thank you so much, Joy. Uh, today, I feel uh, a determined, uh, a renewed sense of hope in our democracy, despite the anti-democratic behavior of Cameron Sexton and the Republican Party in the state of Tennessee. Uh, and at the same time, we still feel the feelings of mourning with our brothers and sisters in Louisville, Kentucky, who suffered from a mass shooting, and our brothers and sisters in Nashville, who have served, unfortunately, as a catalyst to this conversation because of the mass shooting at the Covenant School. And we continue to hold them in our hearts as we also realize that this is a different moment in American and Tennessee history for change to happen. Uh, and we are going to use this platform to elevate the issue of ending gun violence and not allow the status quo which has only led to more deaths, only led to inadequate responses to things that we actually have responsibility to do, uh, not just offer thoughts and prayers, but offer legislation and offer policies uh, that could lead to positive transformation. That's gonna be the work that we do in the State House, despite uh, and in spite of the Republican Party. You know, it's funny because we're going to talk a little bit later in the show. I mean, as young as you are, uh, my favorite sign, uh, by the way, that was outside when you all were in these in the protest mode was no Justin's, no peace. They wanted both of the Justin's back. But, um, you know, I, we're going to know later in the show that, you know, the, the young police officer in Louisville who's still fighting for his life, as young as mm -hmm. you are, is younger than you. You know, and, and yeah. so you all are a generation that has spent your lives doing active shooter drills in school. My kids are your age and have done it since third grade. You wrote this incredible essay in The New York Times where you talk about your friend Larry Thorne. Um, you already know a, a dead person, your age, you, somebody who died your age. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that and about just the trauma of your generation and what, what it, that seems to be what led you into public service. Mm -hmm. uh, being of service to our community in District 86 has been my mission and goal. We were called the path of least resistance by Valero Energy Corporation Plains All-American who wanted to build a crude oil pipeline through our community. We galvanized and organized saying that there's something about this sense of place that is important and we defeated that pipeline. Uh, and now we face this challenge of the proliferation of guns and of gun violence. Larry and I graduated Mitchell High School together. Uh, we were the exact same age and in January 10, three days after my birthday, Larry was killed by gun violence. The reality is there are too many people who have their hands on guns and too few people in positions of power doing something about gun prevention. Larry loved working with the bands, worked in a middle school, was literally the light of his mother, his grandmother, his brother, his community's life, and his life was cut short. Uh, it was taken because of gun violence. And we have people who are legislators who instead of saying, let's address the issue of gun violence in a holistic multifaceted way, invest the necessary resources that we need to in order to solve this problem. Their solution is to expel lawmakers who go to the well of the house saying our silence and business as usual is wrong. Uh, our, our allegiance to the National Rifle Association and to the Tennessee Firearms Association is wrong. And they hastily, Cameron Sexton was very quick to uh, work on our expulsions, but it is not very quick to come up with solutions that could save people like Larry's life. And we have the leader of the Republicans in the House, William Lambert, whose recommendation was, I'll put a tank in front of every school. But Larry and I graduated 10 years ago. What about the other parts of our communities? A tank in front of a school wouldn't have saved the lives of, of our, our brothers and sisters and siblings in Louisville. The reality is we have a problem in our country uh, that is gonna require us to think differently and to act differently as it relates to who has access to guns. The fact that we don't have permits, uh, you don't need a permit to hold most guns in the state of Tennessee. The fact that we're lowering the age range for people to have long guns, things like this only make us less safe. 
especially when we have weapons of war uh, in the hands of regular people. 70 plus percent of Tennesseans don't want to see that because they want people like Larry to be alive. They want people like the ones in Nashville and Louisville to be alive. And this is the moment in time for our country for us to do something differently. And I believe and I am hopeful that across our country, if we keep raising our voice on this issue, we will create justice and ensure that people like Mrs. LaVonda Thorne Henderson doesn't have to bury her son and we don't have to bury our friends and our colleagues and our grandparents in perpetuity. Uh, you know, there is some movement. Um, you know, it's not a huge movement, but Governor Bill Lee has now um, expressed support for red flag laws. Um, he has signed an executive order um, that would strengthen background checks for gun purchases. I I is that a good start? And do you expect the legislature to actually now take action now that they have humiliated themselves by trying to humiliate the three of you? Mm -hmm. We have institutional problems within the state legislature where the Republican Party is overusing and abusing their power to turn our democracy into a mobocracy, where mob rules and not the people rule. And we have in this moment, the attention of the country and the world looking at Tennessee, saying what is wrong and what are we gonna do differently? I believe there are, those are fine signals from Governor Bill Lee, but we need to have good and fine legislation coming from the Tennessee State House. It's one thing to have an executive order, but those can easily fade with the new administration. It needs to be a law. It's one thing to say that you wanna have red flag laws. It's another thing to bring people together and communities that have been impacted and parents that have suffered together and say, what type of laws would you like to see? And that was one of our arguments. We wanna see red flag laws. I myself, Representative Jones, Representative Johnson advocated. We wanna see gun storage safety laws as well. We wanna see the expansion of background checks. And there's so many other good laws that exist that most people want because they don't want their grocery stores to turn into war zones. We don't want our churches to turn into war zones. We don't want our schools to be war zones either. We wanna live safe in our communities. And whatever we have done in the status quo has led us to this point. And so we need to do something different. And sometimes even that's breaking the quorum of house rules in order to change the conversation in the state of Tennessee in our country to create more just laws that actually protect us. Yeah, you did, as you wrote in your op-ed, it is something when decorum allows someone to, from the well of the House, uh, recommend returning to lynching in the hanging tree, but not to stand up for justice for the children who are in the gallery. Um, I have to ask you about this, because we watched these mainly older white men treat uh, mm -hmm. you all, but, but particularly you and Justin Jones with utter disrespect. And you are their colleagues, no matter how young you are. Um, mm -hmm. And I have this piece in front of me from Politico, and it isn't from 1973, it's literally from this year from April, that talks about former members of that body, Cade Cothran, saying black people are idiots. He later has apologized for that, um, is actually now facing some federal charges of bribery and other things. Um, another member uh, referring to wetbacks when telling a story about the border. On other occasions, joking about people in your the body, in the Republican body, Republicans publicly cracking jokes about black people eating fried chicken. And then there was this one, a former Republican legislative staff member told this reporter, whose name is Natalie Allison, that in 2020, a member of the House Republican leadership in a text message referred to your colleague, um, Justin Jones, then an activist who was trying to take down the Nathan Bedford Forrest statue and advocate just as you were an activist as well, referred to himself and another black lawmaker as baboons. That's the atmosphere that you work in. Um, you also have had that same Republican leadership threaten to punish the city of Memphis, the great city of Memphis, for returning you to your office. How do you work mm -hmm. with people like that? And do you expect your city to actually be financially punished, Haiti style, for daring mm -hmm. to stand up for their elected representative? The state capitol run by the Republican majority is a toxic work environment. I will be the first to admit that. It is undergirded by white supremacy and patriarchy. It has for too long operated as a place of injustice and, and, and disservice to the people of the state of Tennessee. Those are the things that undergird the foundations of the institution. But something that's really important for all of us to know who are in the movement for justice is that institutions do not in and of themselves build or develop moral courage. 
In fact, there may be a good few folks inside, but it's the people outside of institutions who externally push for it to be better, who demand accountability at the voting booth, but also every time that the session opens and who says, I'm going to check every bill and I'm going to make sure that I raise my voice for each piece of legislation that helped to transform the people and the institution itself to be a more democratic place. And that is the, the hope that I have, even for working in an institution like this. But the truth, the, the truth of those comments, the truth of other comments are real. And it is a difficult and a challenging place for us to be, but it's not a place so challenging that we cannot be there and that we should not be there to fight for our constituents and for the people in District 86. And the reality is the, the threats uh, they, and, and retaliation has happened before against Memphis and Millington, Shelby County, the district that we represent. And so it is a concern that we have. But again, we will be watching, we will be paying attention, and we will be holding this legislature accountable for doing the things that we're supposed to do, like ending gun violence and reducing poverty.